church. We're so glad that you tuned in and that you're joining us. We're going to go ahead and start worship.
you. God, we are so grateful for your love. Your love that chases us down, that fights till we're found. God, you come after our hearts. And I'm so grateful that you do. God, I'm so grateful that you seek us out and you give yourself to us. Jesus, we have gathered on screens and in all these different places, but God, we've still gathered to lift your name high, God, to worship you, to declare again and remind our souls again that you are Lord of all, that you're God of the universe. And God, we bow our knee before you and we say, have your way. We declare your grandeur and your grace and your majesty again. We love you, Jesus. I stand upon the solid rock of faith in Christ. This steadfast hope shall not break apart within the trial. I am assured His promises will never fail. As long as life remains, He is faithful. God is God is kind, He does not envy, He does not boast, His ways are higher than my own, His thoughts consume the great unknown, of this alone I am sure, my God is
touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are healing, healing every heart. I worship you. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, you're mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around. I worship you, you are here, you mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Light in the 
Tanner. <laughs> He's Tanner. And we're here with you guys Nailed today. It. So good. Hey, thank you so much for joining us thank online you. today. Uh, we miss you guys like crazy. We love y'all so much. Love you. Um, if you are a first time guest, welcome to Grace Fellowship Church. Thanks for being with us. Um, if you are that first time guest, we would love to know that you joined us today. And the way that you can let us know that is um, you can go over to the chat that's on your screen somewhere. Uh, you can comment if you would and just let us know that it's your first time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some awesome hosts who are hosting that chat and would love to welcome you uh, and just uh, say thank you for joining us today online. Um, it is such an honor to have you with us. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Ron, a reminder for everybody else that in that chat, um, our hosts are going to be sending out links. So these links are opportunities for everybody to take next steps. So that's for our first time guests as well. So make sure you're looking out for those links. There's also a drop down menu uh, at the top of your screen that gives those same links, takes you to next spaces for next steps that you want to take, whether that's giving or serving, whatever it looks like. So make sure you're looking out for those. And speaking of giving, uh, I want to remind you of a couple ways that you can do that. I know you like that. You can do that today. Uh, so first off, we have our online option, which is you can go to our, our website, which is gracelocking.org, and you can give there. Uh, the other option is you can text to give today, which is just texting the number 84321. That's it right there. Both really easy options to set up and use, so thank you guys so much for taking care of that today, and thank you for being with us. It's awesome. Hey, I wanted to celebrate and shout out our Grace Kids Ministry. That's right. Uh, they had, uh, over the last couple of months, a memory verse challenge that they were all participating in. A yeah. bunch of kids uh, did this and memorized verses, but there were three uh, that memorized all 10 Bible verses. So that was right. Ben, Aiden, and Ezekiel. So huge best. shout out and congratulations to those guys. Right, they, got the, the, they got the prize, which yep. was pizza from wherever they wanted. And I wish I had some way right now to like celebrate something fun, like a popper. Do I have an idea? Or, what is it? Uh, what is it? Hey! Oh! <laughs> What is that a leaf blower? Yeah, you said celebrate. <laughs> Why? We're, we're celebrating. <laughs> I'm gonna take that All right. away from you. Well, hey, great job. To Good you guys. job, guys. Well right. done. We'll Seriously, celebrate better next time. All right. But hey, uh, anyways, we'll celebrate better next time. Yeah, we will. One more thing that we want to remind you guys of uh, is that we told you that we are going to have a reopening team who is working church. towards reopening uh, the church and that every week we give you some updates. So um, our update for this week is that we want to let you guys know is that there's going to be a survey um, that is going out on social media on our website. And this survey is going to help us as we plan uh, and get ready to reopen the church. Um, just kind of want to know where people are standing, what your, uh, what your views are, where you're standing when it comes to us reopening and when that needs to happen so that we can do things things the right way so we can make sure that everybody is safe yes. and that everybody has a space here at Grace. So be looking out for that survey. It's going to be out very soon in the next few days. Do so it. Check that out. Fill it out. Um, thank you guys so much for filling that out. We truly, truly appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. That's it. That's it. We did so it. So guys, it's time to jump into the message with Josh. We'll see you later. See ya. Hello, my name is Josh Trivola, pastor at uh, Grace Fellowship Church. And before we do anything else, it is my privilege to be the one to remind you that this is Memorial Day weekend. And Memorial Day weekend is more than just grilling great meat or finding a great sale at a store. Um, Memorial Day weekend is much bigger than all that. Uh, this is the time that our country sets aside for remembering those who have paid the ultimate cost for our freedom. And I think it's wise for us. I, I love that we do this and, and that we have this uh, regular reminder um, because we are surrounded, especially here at Grace Fellowship Church in uh, Lawton, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, we are surrounded by people who um, are already serving our country as soldiers, but we're reminded of the fact that there are some that are not just willing to give their lives, but who have given their lives. Jesus said this in the scripture. He said, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And I just love the way Jesus calls out this greatest love 
Someone who is willing to sacrifice themselves in that way. You know, I think here in America, freedom is like, it, it's just like the air that we breathe. It's, it's, it's like the, the water that, that a fish swims in. It's like you almost don't even know it's there. You take it for granted. And so I think this weekend is a time where we would do well to stop and remember all that we've been given. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you, Jesus, for this reminder. Thank you for what has been purchased for us God, we are so grateful, Lord, and we give you praise. Lord, thank you for those folks who were willing to sacrifice for us. Um, Lord, thank you for the families right now, Lord, who are going without a loved one um, amongst them because of that sacrifice. Lord, we're mindful of them as well. Jesus, would you comfort those families? But God, right now, I pray that you would just, as the people of God, you would stir us with gratitude for all that we've been given in this country. Lord, we've been given so much. We've been blessed so much. As we turn the corner right now and, and we start thinking about your word and the message that you have for, for us from the scripture, God, I pray that this would be a time where scripture comes to life, where we would understand things we've never understood before. I pray you challenge us, Lord. I pray you teach us, Jesus. Lord, we sit at your feet, Rabbi Jesus. Come and teach us new things. And God, I pray that the word of God and, and, and Jesus would be elevated above all things in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Um, so we've been talking about in this series, um, uh, You Asked For It is the title of it. And we called it that because you asked for it. We, we spoke with you. We reached out to you with a special survey weeks ago. And we asked you what your biblical topics were or your questions that you wanted us to preach on. And then we took those and we built a series around it. And I would say, generally speaking, you have made these questions pretty tough this year. We did it a year ago as well, but they've been really tough this year. Listen to this question that we're going to be speaking on today, it says, are Christians anti-science? Are Christians anti-science? I think this is such a wise question, the way that this one has been put together. There's a lot of questions that you could have asked regarding um, God and, and proofs about God or difficulties people might have about believing in God or about science. What you specifically asked about, if you think about it, it's a relationship question. So are Christians against science? Are Christians, or is God, at war with science? Like, is there a problem there in the relationship? Um, I would answer that in short form, just no. <laughs> uh, it, it is not a war. There is not a, a battle raging, even though it might feel like that. We're gonna, we're gonna dive into that today. Let's talk about science for just a minute. Do you like science? Because I like science, actually. There's a lot of things that I depend on from science, like the medical community and the medical field, it seems like they keep cranking out uh, new medications and new types of surgeries in order to solve problems. I like the fact that they're solving problems. I like science, amen? You like science. I like the fact that there's a new iPhone every year and it just keeps getting better and they take my money for the, for the new one. I like that there's science and that technology is advancing. I like in the midst of this coronavirus crisis that our country has been in, there are scientists right now that are working hard to come up with a vaccine so that we can get past this. Um, can you affirm science here for just a minute? Because this is not going to be a day where we bash science. But sometimes we are in a spot as Jesus followers where we can feel like science is here and maybe faith is here. And we might struggle with, do I have to make a choice and do I have to give one up? Sometimes it does feel like they can be enemies. When I was a church kid, I think I was about 13 years old. I went to this uh, conference, this church conference, and I think it was like for VBS or, or kids or something like that. And I remember going there, and one of the speakers who was at this conference, he was a creationist, and, and he was a speaker who was trying to defend a, a particular view of creationism. And, and he was very impressive. He had all this evidence that he showed us that day. And as he talked to us, he gave us his view and the way he presented it was, if you don't believe against evolution, that evolution is false, and believe in this particular kind of creationism, then you can't really be a Bible-believing Christian. And, and, and I remember that was just a framework that was put out there for me as a young believer. 
Um, I remember there were these um, little uh, uh, comic strips, that uh, comic booklets that were given to me in the church. Christians have comics too. So it was this, this weird little comic that was given to me. And, and in the comic, there was like a, a Christian teenager kind of a character. And then Satan was like trying to get the teenager to believe in evolution. And, and, and it was all like super scary. And, and then once the teenager started to believe in evolution, all of a sudden, suddenly, I'm not sure how it connected, but they were into drugs. And suddenly they were like drunk driving and they died in a car wreck and they went straight to hell. And, and I'm like, oh God, this is, this is a lot of pressure regarding science and evolution. And I remember going to a college biology class. And in this college biology class, they, they started to unfold all this stuff that I had not seen before. It was at Illinois State University, it was a secular university, and, and they were talking about microevolution, not, not like you can get from an amoeba to a man, but they were talking about these small little tiny steps of change that, that, that might happen in organisms over time. And they had this, this one illustration uh, out of history, this, this, this peppered moth situation where these particular kinds of moths had better camouflage in a certain situation, and they were not eaten by predators as readily, and so they started to prop and multiply better and they became dominant. And they gave that, that to us as an example of microevolution. And I remember seeing that as a Christian and thinking like, this makes sense to me, this microevolution. This makes sense to me. Um, they've convinced me even. And, and I now find myself believing some aspects of evolutionary theory. And then I remember the, the very next thought is, is, did I just lose my salvation? No, I didn't. I didn't. But I was confused. Have you ever been confused? Uh, what about the picture that Hollywood gives us about science? Um, it feels like in the books and the TV shows and the movies, uh, the way it comes at us is you might have a cast of characters, but there's always that one really brainy character, right? And, and they almost always wear glasses and they're that scientific, academic type of a person. And they almost always in the story, you find that they can't believe in God, that they don't have faith. And it's, it's just like they're too, um, they're too educated. They're too smart. All that stuff, it's like Santa Claus. All that stuff, they just can't believe it anymore. And you, you get to this place, if you're anything like me, where when you see that person start to come up in the story, you can almost know exactly where everything is going to head. Even in Nacho Libre, which is a great movie, I highly recommend it. There's this guy, Hector, who refuses to get baptized because he says he believes in science. Hollywood. Hollywood paints a picture for us tells us that this is how it is. And I'm not so sure that it's true. Um, maybe, the, maybe the upbringing that you had in church um, led you to be suspicious of science. Maybe you had Sunday school teachers and pastors and even grandparents who whenever um, there would be a new scientific discovery, it was met with suspicion or opposition and they'd roll their eyes and there they go again. You know, it's like coming against the Bible and treating it like it's a battle and treating it like it's an ongoing war and just everybody knows this. And, and, and there's like, there's this, there's this dream that, 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 Christians seem to have where the, you're, you're going to walk into a biology class and there's going to be a biology professor, a, a scientist there, and the Christian is going to have some debate with the, with the biology professor and the Christian's going to win and the Christian's going to battle and the Christian's going to win. And, and, and you know, that's, that's, um, that's a chain email uh, picture and story that I was sent maybe a hundred different times and it never happened. I just, if you've ever forwarded that chain email before, I just want you to let you know that picture never happened. But there's a hostility that we feel and those things are created and those fictions are created because we feel this war like, like it's out there. Ma Matthew 22 verse 37, see if we can bring some sanity to this. It says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. So Jesus says, part of your worship and you loving God is to bring your mind into it. Have you ever felt like if I was going to be a Christian, I've got to check my brain at the door. 
But Jesus envisions we can, we can worship God not just with our hearts and souls, but with our minds as well. And how do we do that if science is at war with Christianity? It doesn't make sense. So here's what I'm going to do today. There's all kinds of different things that we could be talking about regarding science and arguments for and against God and all, all this kind of stuff. But I think the question that we were asked today has to do with a relationship, the relationship between science and faith. And are they at war with each other truly? And so that is the question that I'm going to go after in a very, very focused way. And I'm going to do it uh, with, with two steps at least to get us going. I'm going to ask the question, is science at war with faith? And is faith at war with science? Let's start with, is science at war with faith? Um, oftentimes we believe that. Oftentimes we believe this agenda about scientists, like scientists to get together in a, in a dark basement somewhere and like plot the end of Christianity, right? Um, I don't know that that's really true. <laughs> um, let me hit you with some information. This is from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, this association, it it's, it's, was started in the 1800s, and it carries currently 120,000 uh, scientific members in this association. It is the largest general scientific society in the world, and they actually publish out of that organization the well-known scientific journal, Science if you've ever heard that. They did a poll of their members in 2009. So they polled all these scientists and look at the results of it. 51% um, of those scientists said that they believe in a deity or a higher power. 31% believe not just in a higher power, but in a personal God. 7% are agnostic and say, maybe there's a God, but I just don't know. That kind of bucks the stereotype, doesn't it? It's crazy. When I read that, I was just blown away. You mean all these people who are so um, educated and they've got all of these degrees and, and they're so brainy, they're so intelligent that they want to devote their entire lives to the study of science. It's like that's who they are. And when they pulled those people, they said, you know what, you, you might expect maybe 90% or 100% of those people got to a point where they just had to do away with faith. They didn't. 51% found faith, which blows my mind. Here's, a, here's another shocker. Many scientists have found God through their science. Um, they found God through their science. Francis Collins is someone you may have heard about in the news. Francis Collins is uh, the, the great geneticist. Um, he was known for, during the Bill Clinton presidential era, uh, the, the United States poured a bunch of money into mapping the human gene, genome, the, the DNA strand of humanity. And, and uh, uh, Francis Collins was the, the scientist that was over that project. And if you study the life of Francis Collins, um, he didn't, of course, start out as a famous geneticist. Um, he grew up as an atheist. Um, but while he was a grad student at Yale, if you read his story, he had a particular uh, confrontation in a hospital with a, with a patient that was there, grad student at Yale. And he converted to Christianity as a result of that confrontation. He wrote that from that point forward, from, from grad school on, he found scientific discoveries were an opportunity for him to worship God. Blows my mind. So science did not take him away from God, took him toward God, and he's still a believer today. Alan Rex Sandage, he died in 2010, um, super popular, um, influential astronomer. If you know about the Hubble telescope, um, Hubble was the one who peered through his telescope and, and as he studied the universe and cosmology, he was the one that discovered that the universe was, were, was expanding and that, that um, galaxies were actually separating further and further from each other. And his theory went on to actually develop the Big Bang Theory. Um, that, that came from Hubble. The guy who took over from Hubble in 1953 was Alan Rex Sandage. And now he took over in 1953, but in 1983, 30 years later, this scientist converted to Christianity, became a believer. 
This is what Sandage said. He says, it was my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than can be explained by science. It is only through the supernatural that I can understand the mystery of existence. See, Science doesn't have to kill anybody's faith questions or anybody's faith journey. In, in fact, it can enhance it. Um, here's, a, here's a confusing piece. Back to our original thing. Sometimes it can feel like there's a war between faith and science. We just gave some of the reasons why. Some of the, some of the reason is because sometimes scientists will not stay in their lane. Um, sometimes Christians won't stay in their lane either, really. Uh, but sometimes scientists won't stay in their lane. What do I mean by that? Science is inherently, because of its discipline, it is limited. Science is really great at, through the scientific method, observing phenomena and being able to write down what they observe in that phenomena, and then we learn knowledge as a result. Science is, is the, the discipline that comes to, to water and says every time we, we heat water to a particular degree, water will boil, and science can tell us at what temperature water will boil. But, but, but science cannot tell us where we got water from. Science can tell us what it can observe about creation, but it cannot tell us the order or the origin, I'm sorry, of creation. It is operational. It is not origin related. Evolution. Evolution uh, uh, can tell us about uh, fossils. Scientists who believe in evolution, they can, they can study fossils, but, but they have no idea. They don't have the ability to peer into the origin of those organisms that created those fossils that we might, may or may not have in our possession. Who made the organisms? Why were they made? What was the character of the being that made those things? See, that is not a physics question. It's a metaphysics question. Meta, what does meta mean? Meta, meta is added onto the word physics. It means, it means after or it means beyond physics. There, there, are, there are things that we can learn through the scientific method, but there are other things, even maybe bigger things, that can't be answered by scientists. And sometimes scientists don't want to stay in their lane and they try to answer those things anyway. Stephen Hawking, Hawking was known for this. Um, he, he was a super smart guy. Uh, smarter than anybody in this room, smarter than anybody watching this video right now, Stephen Hawking, I, I mean, just, and it had an amazing life if you've ever read about his life and if you've ever read some of the uh, books that he's produced. Um, I've read a bit of him and, and uh, just a brilliant thinker. He's just been a gift to humanity. And all that he's learned, especially about astrophysics and cosmology and, 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 and the time-space continuum and relativity and, and, and Stephen Hawking. I mean, he's just, he's a legend. But sometimes in his book, Stephen Hawking would do this thing where, where not only was he talking about what science could observe, but he would go a bit too far and he would draw conclusions. And, and, and sometimes he would say, this is what we've learned about creation. This is what we learned about how the earth and the universe came about. And because I feel like I can explain it according to my theory, I'm going to tell you that I don't believe it needed God to exist. I think the universe created itself. And he starts to make a metaphysical conclusion based on his, his understanding of science. And he goes too far. Um, Baroness Susan Greenfield, um, one of England's most distinguished scientists, at the time that uh, Hawking published his book and drew the conclusions on metaphysics that he did, this Baroness, she said this, she said, all science is provisional and therefore to claim to have the definitive answer to anything is a hard line view. It would be a very great shame if young people think that to be a scientist, you must be an atheist. There are plenty of scientists who also have Christian faith, she says. I think that's incredibly honest of her to say our discipline has limitations and we should stay within those limitations. And she's not the only one. Stephen Gould also said this. He's a professor, a professor of paleontology at Harvard University. At least he was. He died a few years ago. He was an agnostic. Stephen Gould said this. He said, science is not a discipline that claims to establish certainty. Science simply cannot, by its legitimate methods, adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence. That means God's rule and his impact of nature. 
We neither affirm nor deny it. We simply cannot, we simply can't comment on it as science, uh, scientists. It has limitations. And then Alan Rex Sandage says this, there need be no conflict between science and religion if each appreciates its own boundaries. And if each takes seriously the claims of the other, the proven success of science simply cannot be ignored by the church on the one hand. But neither can the church's claim to explain the world at the very deepest level be dismissed. He says, listen, there's physics and there's metaphysics and we need to stay in our boundaries. We need to stay in our lane. What's, what's physics? See, physics is, is about the what. Metaphysics is about the how and the who and the why. And, and for some of you, those are the, the deeper questions of reality and the universe. Whenever you talk about science and faith, what many of us are really asking about is Genesis chapter 1 in the Bible. What many of us are really wondering about is, is how, do we, how do we take Genesis chapter 1 and, and, and marry it up with what scientists are telling us over here? And what do we do when we see um, uh, conflicts, um, physics and metaphysics? What do you learn in Genesis chapter 1? You learn the metaphysics, don't you? You learn the how and the who and the why. It's the who. In the beginning, God. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, before there was a space-time continuum, before there was a universe, in eternity past, in the beginning, God. I mean, it's, it's one of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture because into the black nothingness that was here somehow, there was God. Uh, the, 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 the theologians call that ex nihilo, that when he created, he created the world out of nothing. And that's the nature of his power. In the beginning, God, he didn't take anything else. Like so many other creation myths from other religions and other ancient societies have talked about how creation came about. And they're always wanting to form the universe out of something else. God creates the universe out of nothing. It's his nature. God is incredibly powerful, and, and he is incredibly creative. And so all the variety of everything in nature comes out of this one God, and he has the power to simply speak it, and the thing exists. And that's what Genesis teaches you. He, he's also a personal God. You see that in Genesis 1. This is all the metaphysical stuff. It's like he's a personal God. He creates Adam and he creates Eve and he creates them in the image of God. Not to just be, be um, uh, organisms to fill a world and then walk away from them or to watch them from afar. God creates them in a personal way and they're given names and he creates them in the image of God and he breathes into them the breath of life with his own mouth. And man becomes a living soul. He's a personal God. The creation also, Genesis 1 tells us, the creation was good. Every single thing that God creates, he steps back from it and he says it was good or it was very good. Again, it's not this, it's not this, cruel, dark, cold view of the world that I'm just a speck of dust in an endless universe and that I, I mean nothing and that am, animals are simply fighting against each other and there's violence for the sake of dominance and for the sake of survival and, and it's a bleak picture instead. No, Genesis comes along and says, God creates these things and he speaks that it is good. He speaks that plants and animals are good. They are at peace with their creator. Men and women are good. And the heavens declare the glory of God. The entire creation declares the glory of God. I love that Adam was called God's son. Why? Because God loved them. These are the big questions. These are the big answers in Genesis 1. Okay, now I'm still in this realm of science and is science, science in a battle against Christianity? Is it a war? Um, I, again, I would say no. But, but at the same time, before I move on to Christianity, I've just got to stop for a quick minute and talk about the fact that every single thing that science tells us as Christians, even though we may not be at war with them, it doesn't mean that we just swallow everything they tell us. Um, there are some theories within the scientific world that I have doubts about. Do you have doubts about some of them? Evolution. The idea of design from chaos. 
There may be wisdom in certain parts of that, but I, I, I certainly am not willing or ready as a person to swallow all of it. Like when Linda and I went on our honeymoon, we went to the Grand Canyon. And I remember they gave us this honeymoon suite and we were right on the edge of the canyon. And I remember going to bed and, and waking up the next morning. It was this huge picture window at the feet of our bed. And as we woke up and kind of kind of sat up in our bed, we saw the huge Grand Canyon right in front of us outside of our window. And it's this majestic, glorious, beautiful thing. And, and when you look at it and other people look at it, they see different things. Christians might see the glory of God. Someone else might look at that and say, well, you know, over millions or billions of years, you know, water and, and, and rivers, they flow down through this rock and, and they, they dug the, these trenches out and all this kind of stuff. It just took time and it took water. And, and here we have this natural phenomena. And it's like, and I can see how they get there. I might even have a, a certain respect for how they got there. But that's the Grand Canyon. You walk over to like the, to Mount Rushmore and you see the, the presidents chiseled in stone. And you can't look up at that and say that that was just time plus, plus chance, plus chaos brought you that. No, that's, that was intelligence. And that was design that carved out a particular form in the likeness of a person. It's like you, you just see that instantly. Other problems that might come up with revol uh, evolution is there's, there's people who will talk about evolution. What they mean is microevolution, like those malls that I was talking about. Other people might mean macroevolution, that there, there, there were these, these big moments of, of one organism becoming a completely different kind of organism. And I'm not sure that I'm in a place where I'm ready to swallow that. Um, you study more deeply, you'll get into the, the, the Precambrian explosion in the fossil record. And, and, and there aren't good answers for why that is. It, uh, you, you might look at the fossil record and, and there's huge gaps in the fossil record as scientists attempt to prove evolution. There's, there's gaping holes, there's blind spots in the middle of that. I'm not saying as Christians, we need to just embrace that wholesale. Not at all. Richard Dawkins uh, said this, he said, some species of the unjustly called primitive amoebas have as much information in their DNA as 1,000 Encyclopedia Britannica. Richard Dawkins is a well-known atheist, and he's writing this. Um, a lot of big words in that, right? <laughs> so you got these amoebas, and he's saying, listen, there's more information in their DNA than you could put in 1,000 um, encyclopedias. And what he's saying is, at the same time, in the same breath that he's able to admit that level of complexity, he says it's not designed and there's not an intelligence behind it. And instead, I think it all happened by chance and out of chaos. I struggle with that. And I'm not saying that I know better than they do. I, I hope there's a humility in me that, that stays in my lane and, and respects their, their, their understanding and respects their education. But I'm not saying that I just swallow everything either. Is faith at war with science? Let's come at it from the other side. Um, again, Genesis 1. Is faith at war with science? This is, this is the big battleground, if there is one, is Genesis 1. Genesis 1 on the surface looks like se seven different days where God created the world. And in those seven days, um, because it was seven days, it would yield, if, 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 again, if you continue to read the scripture and follow the genealogies that are presented there, we may have an earth, we may have a world and a universe that's only 6,000 or, or even 10,000 years old. Yet the scientists tell us it's billions of years old. And so what do you do with Genesis 1? We're going to dive into that just a little bit. I don't think any of you are going to be satisfied by the end, but we're going to dive into it a little bit. Verse 1 says, in the beginning, God, we already mentioned that, he created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, so he speaks his word, let there be light. And there was light. Because God said it, the creativity and the power came together and there was light. And then God saw the light was good. And then he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. 
Now, I've got that word day there underlined because that right there is the crux of the issue. That, that, that word, that little word, it was the first day. And if you continue to read it, you're going to continue to see the way that God develops the sun and the moon and the stars and the way that he works out the firmament or the, the, the atmosphere. And then vegetation comes in and fish and animals and birds and everything that crawls on the ground. And eventually men and women come into this world that God creates. But every single portion, every single category of what God creates happens on a day. And the Hebrew word for that day there is yom. Yom. Um, in the Hebrew, that word can mean day or it can mean age. It can mean year epoch, or a period of time. It's one of those words where you really want it to be super straightforward and simple, and sometimes it's just not in the scripture that way. Uh, last week, we talked about how the scripture is our ultimate authority, and that we, we believe the truth that we find in scripture. But we also talked last week about the fact that if you want to fully understand the heart of God, you've got to read the entire counsel of God. You can't just stick in one spot and take some things out of context. You gotta be very, very careful. And I would say Genesis 1 has got this history in the church of being a spot where it, you've gotta be very, very careful about how you read it and about how you read the yom right there. Um, uh, let me give you another verse. This is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. And the reason I'm giving you this is because I want you to see this same Hebrew word yom used in a different place and in a different way. It says, Hebrew, human pride will be brought down and human arrogance will be humbled. Only the Lord will be exalted on that day of judgment. For the Lord of heaven's armies has a day of reckoning. He will punish the proud and mighty and bring down everything that is exalted. What's he talking about? Is he talking about a literal 24-hour day? I don't think so. He's talking about a time. He's talking about, he's talking about a, 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 a moment, a season where his judgment comes. He's saying that's when it will happen. And he picks a place out in the future, a place of time. And he uses that Hebrew yom to define it. And you'll see all throughout scripture, the talk of the day of the Lord. But then you, you read the, the, the different aspects of the day of the Lord in the book of Revelation and other places. It seems like there's a whole lot going on that, that could just be contained inside of one 24-hour day. And this is just, this is such a huge topic. Is it a 24-hour day in Genesis or not? Um, I can't do it justice fully today. Um, there's all kinds of study that I've read as far as trying to reconcile what happens in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which, which is in, in some ways a repeat of Genesis 1. There are scholars that look at Genesis 1 and they see issues with considering it a 24-hour day. Or they, they talk about gaps that might exist between the 24-hour days, specifically between day 1 and day 2. There are some scholars that look at Genesis 1 and they say this is more, more poetry or it's more or a song, you might come down on a different spot on how you feel about that. If I told you last week, our family was up in Oklahoma City and we came back to Elgin, drove back to Elgin, and it took forever for us to get back from Oklahoma City. When I say that, you would not take me literally, would you? Because if it had taken us forever to get from Oklahoma City, I would still be on the road driving from Oklahoma City, right? Be careful how you read God's word, that you don't apply rules to it, that you don't apply to normal life and the way that you understand language. Again, this is an area that is worth studying. And I think different people, even in our church, would come down in different spots after having studied this thing deeply, but you've got to study it deeply. I'm going to read some uh, quotes to you from some other pastors and theologians, just because I want you to just take this in. I want you to take in the variety of what some of these different leaders say after having studied this very deeply. The first one is from C.S. Lewis. And he says, I am not either attacking or defending evolution. He says, I believe that Christianity can still be believed even if evolution is true. 
This is where you and I differ. And he's saying this in the Ackworth letters. This is a letter that he wrote to a gentleman named Ackworth who had written a work on evolution at that time in England. And C.S. Lewis is basically saying, I really kind of don't care about whether or not evolution was right or not because the ultimate question is who was in control of the evolution if it happened? Who is, who, is the, who is the puppet master? Who is the one that decided how this would be designed and how it would be run? Because that person at the end of the day is God. Francis A. Schaeffer said, we must leave open the exact length of time indicated by day. That's Yom again in Genesis. I'll jump to Jack Hayford. Pastor Jack Hayford said, there is a very real point of conflict that has been created in much of the church because of attitudes of bigoted or self-righteous people, if you don't believe in creationism this way, then you are not a Bible believer in their mind. This simply is not true. And this way that they are describing is usually called the young earth approach. And what he means that by young earth approach is that 6,000 or 10,000 with the literal 24-hour day. He's not saying he doesn't believe it. He's just saying you can't get militant about it. R.C. Sproul says it this way. He says, although the Bible clearly says that the world was created in six days, it gives no date for the beginning of the work. So what he's imagining there is there could have been eons before the creation account started, where maybe there were other stars or other planets in the distant universe. It would be a mistake to become embroiled in too much controversy about the date of creation. Pastor Timothy Keller Genesis 1, he says, does not teach that God made the world in six 24-hour days. So he's very bold there with that. Of course, it doesn't teach evolution either because it doesn't address the actual processes by which God created human life. See, see, he's trying to, Keller is trying to stay in his lane there. Do you see? He's like, I'm not going to go into the natural processes. I'm just telling you what the Bible tells me. Next is Wayne Grudem wrote a systematic theology book. I used this in seminary. He says, both old earth and young earth theories are valid options for Christians who believe the Bible today. I don't know if you were taught that or not, but this really blew me away when I became an adult, started to study this for myself and saw that there was this kind of room here. Pastor John Piper said, we should teach without any qualification that God created the universe and everything in it. It did not spontaneously emerge from a big bang alone. God did it. And that the earth is billions of years old, if it wants to be, see his flexibility there. Whatever science says it is, it is, but man is young and he was good and he sinned. That's John Piper. Look at Martin Luther. He says the days of creation were ordinary days in length. He's arguing for 24-hour days. That was written in 1521. If you read about John Calvin or John Wesley, many other scholars and pastors, even today, believe in that, that literal reading 24-hour yom day in Genesis, and they would say it's 6,000, 10,000 year old universe. Is my point to read all of this stuff to you and say you shouldn't study it on your own? No, you should. Is my point to read some of these old earth pastors and theologians and say, that's the way to go. You've got to believe it's billions of years old. No. Is my point to say it's just, no, it's, it's to show you that there's a variety of view out there from some very strong Bible-believing pastors and theologians out there believing very different things about the Genesis account. I just give you, give you another slide just on the interpretations, look at these really quick. Different interpretations on Genesis 1. These are just the categories. A young earth, literal 24-hour day. Gap theory, where it says that there's millions of years between verse 1 and verse 2 in Genesis. A theistic evolution that, 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 that says that, that the evolution may have happened, but God guided the whole thing. There are some that believe a day-age theory where each day in Genesis, the yom stands for an age of undetermined time. Could be a lot of years. Um, there's a preparing the land um, interpretation that says that all of creation uh, happened in verse 1, and then God used the remaining days simply to prepare those different categories of creation to be ready for man. There's, there's just a lot out there. Look at this from St. Augustine. Um, this is 415 AD. I love St. Augustine. Um, he just gives us some wisdom and brings it all together here. He says, in matters that are so obscure 
and far beyond our vision. And when he writes this, he's writing this in a commentary on that Genesis 1 account, by the way. He says, in matters that are so obscure and far beyond our vision, we find in Holy Scripture passages which can be interpreted in very different ways without prejudice to the faith we've received. We should not battle for our own interpretation, but for the teaching of Holy Scripture. I love, I love the way he puts it there. It's like, be true to the word. I love that. Be true to the word. I'm not saying throw out the word and, and, and don't be truthful or, or, or don't be honest about your interpretation and elevate God's word. But at the same time, don't pick certain interpretations, especially in areas that are more vague and harder to read and build your whole castle right there. Be careful. Now I know I'm not answering everybody's questions about science. God help us, it would take a year to go after all that stuff. And so you might be here today and you might have some really big questions. Um, this, this thing about is faith and is science, are they, are, are they at war with each other? That might not be a theoretical question. That, for you, that might be a really personal question today. Um, I had a friend whose name was Jeff and he, he grew up in a family that was agnostic and he struggled to believe in God all of his life. It wasn't until he was in college and somebody handed him a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And he read that book, just devoured it, and he was able to become a believer. He was able to give his life to Jesus after reading that book. Why? The way he described it to me is he said, Josh, he's like, it's not that I couldn't believe in God. He's like, I just had some really big questions that were out there. And he's like, and I felt like there was these objections. They were like brick walls between me and God. And he, he's like, I was afraid that Christians didn't have answers to those big questions. And when I read Mere Christianity, I saw C.S. Lewis start to knock down some of those walls. And even the ones that I didn't totally agree with, I was at least encouraged that he had a reasonable intellectual answer for some of my questions. And if you haven't gotten all of your questions answered today, which again, I can't, can't believe that you would, but it's like there's so much about science. There's so much about the origin of the world. There's so much philosophically, metaphysically about how do we believe in God? What about the objections we might have to the existence of God? And there are people who have devoted their lives and ministries to somebody like you. I'm gonna give you just three of them here. This is Ravi Zacharias Ministries. If you still got big questions, go out to rzim.org. Even just go out to YouTube and type in Ravi Zacharias and you'll just be amazed at all the videos that pop up about that guy. Uh, or go to reasons.org. That's another really great website. It's, it's uh, run by Hugh Ross, who is a PhD astrophysicist, but he's a believer and he just goes after all kinds of stuff with cosmology and the age of the universe, stuff like that. William Lane Craig at reasonablefaith.org. Um, wonderful guy. He actually grew up in the same area of Illinois that I am from, and I've met William Lane Craig. He came to our church when I was there and, and did some debates there, but he is killer on philosophy and, and, and questions that might be keeping you back from God. Go and read those folks. Also down in the chat, you're going to notice a, a list of books by different authors that go after different topics that you might want to focus in on. There's, there's so many believers that care about you and have not checked their brain at the door. Instead, they've made it their life um, achievement to, to try to answer these questions for you as a ministry to you. Now, if you study this stuff and you want to go after more of this stuff, can I just recommend to you to, that you do this in community? That you go to your life group or you go to your life group leader and let them know the struggles that you're having and the fact that you want to delve deeper in those things and try to study them as a life group or maybe just a few of you over coffee, get some good coffee, right? And get a good book and work through that stuff together because there's something about... Um, there's something about having somebody else with you to bounce ideas off of and dis to discuss and to have the accountability to see the thing through. Here's my point today. If, if, if you're seeking God and you don't have all your questions answered, you are not the enemy of God. You're not the enemy of Christianity. You are not my enemy. I am glad you're listening. I'm glad you're here. Um, I want you to find answers um, at Christi with Christianity, you don't have to check your brain at the door. I think that's one of the greatest gifts. Um, it's one of the greatest gifts that we have. Um, 
it's gotten a bad rap sometimes. Some, some people have talked about Christianity as if it's, if it's not a rational faith or, or they're against knowledge. Christianity is, is for knowledge, for academics, for learning, for rational thought. The university itself, I don't know if you know this, was a Christian invention in the 12th century. Uh, Christians felt like God's world, the way he created it, was so well ordered that, that God had set things up to where we could discover and where we could journey and where we could learn and discover more and more and more because they didn't believe it was chaos. And so they created the university. They put money and they put people behind it. Do you know that Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Dartmouth, and Brown all began as Christian institutions? Because that is the mood of Christianity historically toward science and learning. I love that. I don't have to be, as a Christian, at war with science. I also, and this is important for us to say, I also don't have to be at war with other Christians who don't see Genesis 1 the same way that I do. It doesn't have to divide us. It doesn't have to be the thing. Uh, when I was in college, there was a, a group that had come uh, and, and it started mingling with our Christian group. We were, we were in a group called the Navigators and there was another church that had come in and they were teaching a, a doctrine that said that you had to get water baptized in order to be saved. Like you could give your life to Jesus Christ, you know, by faith, you know. You could give your life to Jesus Christ, but if you didn't get water baptized before you died, you were going to hell. I mean, that's, that's what they told us. And we were all like freaked out by it. And I remember the, the head of our group, his name was Jim Ranella. He gave this talk this one night and, and, and the, the, the the topic of the talk, the, the title of it was, what is a cult? And uh, it, it's, a, it's a really weird thing, right? To say, what is a cult? And, you, and you're thinking, you know, it's like, well, there, there's, there's this person with way too much power and they make me leave my parents and never call them again. And I have to eat weird food and wear weird clothes and live in a commune. It's like, he wasn't talking about that kind of stuff. What he was talking about when he said, what is a cult? What he was talking about is, what does a cult believe different than Christianity? What's the dividing line? between Christianity and when you start to change the beliefs so much that it's not even Christianity anymore. And so he gave us this concept. He's like, major on the majors and minor on the minors. Like you need to know what the core doctrines are of Christianity so that you know where those dividing lines are. Because if you don't know where those dividing lines are, you might find yourself in a life group situation that's really combative with somebody else who just doesn't believe the same basic truths that you do. And, and, and the, the basics, there, there's not many. Let me, let me just show you a slide of what these majors are. The Bible is God's word. Number two, there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Trinity. Number three, Jesus is God. Number four, salvation is by grace through faith alone. It's not by works. That's a big deal. If you're, if you're talking with somebody or you're in relationship with somebody and they don't believe that, they believe you gotta do works, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fundamental change. Verse, or number five is every believer gets the Holy Spirit. Every believer will be resurrected. All believers are essentially one, unified and equal, no matter their race, no matter their gender, anything else. Major on the majors is what he told us. And when you see a list like that as a Christian, what kind of blows your mind is not that it's exclusive, but that it's so inclusive. Like there's so many people in the church that believe different things, but those seven things, those are just basic. They're just foundational. So here's the point. What if you come to my church and you believe that, that uh, the universe is billions of years old, but I believe it's 10,000 years old. Can we be in the same church? Yes. Yes, we can. Can we respect each other as Bible-believing Christians who love Jesus? Yes, we can. And that's the point. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5 says this, or it's 3 through 4 says this. These are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that he calls them wholesome. This is Paul talking. He says, these teachings promote a godly life. They're meat and potatoes. How do you follow God in everyday life? Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. And this stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicion. See, I love this perspective. What Paul is saying is, listen, when you're teaching Jesus to people, it ought to bring out a good fruit in their life that now they're loving Jesus and they're following Jesus. That's what the teaching of Jesus should do. 
But sometimes in the church, there are folks who just get, get uh, laser focused on certain disputable passages in scripture. And they argue it forever. And they divide over it. And, and he says they quibble over the meaning of words. And, 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 and Paul's not saying it's, it, that it's bad to study. Paul's saying it's bad to give a level of importance to this that it starts creating division. Major on the majors, minor on the minors is what he's talking about. All truth is God's truth. Make this statement about Christianity and science. All truth is God's truth. If science finds and uncovers something new that we didn't know before, and it is true, it came from God. And so I don't have to be afraid of it. Um, it can change my pers perspective and my posture as a Christian toward science. I can enjoy science. I can get excited about science. I don't have to be afraid that they're going to come up with something and, and later on I'm going to have to fear it. I'm going to have to have a problem with it. I don't have to fear it. Uh, Andy Stanley said it like this. He said, whenever science comes up with a new discovery, you can say this. Look at this quote. Oh, that's how God did it. Like, if you get nothing else from today's message, what if you just started doing that? Oh, that's how God did it, right? Like, if there's a new discovery in Mars, cool, that's how God did that thing. Do you see, it's like to C.S. Lewis saying, I really don't care about the evolution. I care about who's doing the evolution. I care about the who. A new fossil gets discovered. Thank God, praise God, that's how he did this thing. That can change our worldview. Um, 1 Peter 3.15 says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if somebody asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this with gentleness and respect. Because I'm not afraid of science, because as a Christian, I'm not at war with science, and they're not at war with me, Guess what I can do? Anybody that comes up and asks me a question, I can give them an answer like 1 Peter says. And I can do it with gentleness and respect. I don't have to put up my weapons. I can do it with gentleness and respect. See, Peter, in this passage here, he envisions this world where there are seekers out there. There are people who want to find God, just like my friend in college, Jeff, did. They want to find God. And they find that there are walls between them and God and they've got questions. And Peter says, whenever somebody like that comes up to you, it's a great day. Like have a conversation with this person and they're not your enemy and their question is not your enemy. Actually, this is a person that Jesus loves. And so, so all of a sudden, everything starts to change from a battle and a war to a beautiful moment of Jesus trying to draw somebody to, them, to himself. And I get to be a part of that. I love that. Ravi Zacharias, um, I mentioned him earlier in his ministry, rzim.org. Ravi Zacharias was a, a wonderful, uh, highly intelligent uh, Christian guy. He actually just died this week. Um, died of cancer this week, and the Christian community has been mourning his death because of the great legacy of ministry this guy has had. And, and, and one of the great things about Ravi Zacharias is his life is a testimony to the fact that you don't have to check your brain at the door as a Christian. And I love that. I love that he's, he's made it his, his uh, mission in his life to answer the hard questions. And that's why you can go out on YouTube and different places and you can find spots where people are asking him this question, then asking him this question. And he provides a really well thought out, thorough answer to their question in kindness. Sometimes people need things explained. And that's what he did. Um, I saw this YouTube video of Ravi Zacharias and he had gone and they had rented out this this kind of arena big big 
banquet room or whatever. I don't know what it was. And, and, and it was on a college campus. And, and they would do these really long Q&A meetings where they would just have a microphone up front. And they would let people one at a time ask their really big question that they had. And Ravi from the stage would just take a microphone and just kindly sit there and, and explain and answer. And, and it's just so well thought out. But one of these videos, it says this. This is the title of it. It's this big angry title. It says, Atheist Scientist Questions Ravi Zacharias and Instantly Regrets It. Do you, do you feel the war? Do you feel the battle? And do you feel how the war is in the way of what First Peter is talking about? And if you watch the video, you find that the title is totally wrong. Uh, the way it, 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 it happens is, is this, this man walks up to the microphone and he asks Ravi this question and he identifies himself as, as an atheist and as a scientist and he asks his big deep question and Ravi sits there and over across like seven or eight minutes uh, answers the guy very, very carefully, very patiently, is very respectful with the guy and gives him this big long answer and it, the answer is so good and there's such kind of this momentum to it that the whole audience applauds Ravi right there in that moment. And it's, it's probably a lot of Christians in the room. And they applaud. And, and there's, there's, for a brief moment, there's this feeling of like, yeah, Ravi, you got him. And as the applause starts to die down, you can just see this tone change uh, from Ravi Zacharias in that moment. And, and, and he can tell this is inappropriate, this is wrong because this wasn't a battle. That's not what it was about for him. And, and so what he does is he, he leans in and starts talking to the young man again in order to break the applause down. And he says, thank you. He says, thank you to the man. And he says, you're exactly the kind of person that we come and hold these events for. What's he saying? I didn't come to preach to the choir. I didn't come for all the Christians in the room. I came because there might be seekers today. There might be people who want to find Jesus. And First Peter says, I'm supposed to give an answer. And miraculously, as he says that to the, the, the young man, he remembers his first name is Ethan, and he calls him by his name Ethan, which just blows my mind that he would remember that and be that person. Only reach out is out, and he shakes Ethan's hand and kind of draws him up closer to the stage, and he says, as soon as the event is done, would you please come and find me? I'd love to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Because why? Because that man mattered. Ethan mattered. First Peter says, answer people with gentleness and respect. And how in the world can we do that if we're at war? We can't. So aren't you glad that we're not at war today? Aren't you glad that God has made a way for scientists and for intellectuals and for seekers? I am. Let's pray. Lord God. God, I just want to pray right now, Lord, for anybody who's been confused in the church. And Jesus, I want to pray, Lord, for anybody who's grown up in the church and been told, Lord, that they've got to check their brain at the door. And Lord, they, 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 they felt this tension, Lord, and they didn't know what to do with it, God. I pray for them right now, God, and I pray that the light of truth would come and shine on them, Lord, and help them to understand your heart for them. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that, that science and nature are this playground. Lord, you invite us to play in. God, you're not afraid of it. We can search for truth. We don't have to be afraid of where the search for truth will lead us. God, it'll always lead us to you. And so, God, we can, we can jump in both feet, Lord, and we can enjoy the process. We can enjoy what science does in this world. God, I pray that you would come, Lord, and that you would just settle the fight, settle the battle and the war in our minds. And I pray you'd build a bridge. God, that we would see the calling that you have on us to reach out to people who are asking questions. Give us a ministry, Lord, even here in the church. Help us to give gentle answers, respectful answers to people. We're not enemies. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, church, we're going to go ahead and sing together one more time. I stand upon the solid rock of faith in Christ this 
steadfast hope shall not break apart within the trial. I am assured His promises will never fail. As long as life Great week and be blessed.